got a question to uh, ask you here at the beginning. What does it take for God to get your attention? What does it take for God to get your attention? Uh, you know, each and every one of us, if uh, we are children of God, if we've been uh, born again, accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, if we're a believer, we should be walking with the Lord very closely. It's just all throughout scripture i mean god wants us near to him he wants us there i think that when the apostle paul talked about uh praying without ceasing one of the things he was kind of implying there is that is that we're supposed to basically just be in constant contact with the lord uh, it's like we have a constant conversation with him we're, we're just He's near and dear to our heart. He's close to the front of our heads, and, and he's there. But truth of the matter is we all know that it is easy to wander away. It's easy with the, the hustle and bustle of life to, uh, to forget about him. It's easy for us to go a long time without even factoring him into our life. And so what does it take for him to get our attention? What does it take for him to get our attention when we have, have really done what the hymn said, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the one I love? What does God have to do to get your attention? That's kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I brought it up last week, but... The truth of the matter is when you go to scripture uh, we learn an awful lot about pain and suffering and pain and suffering are things that God uses in some really good ways I mean you cannot learn patience without going through some hard times some stressful times where God is stretching your patience I mean bad things don't always mean you've done bad Bad things are often used by God for good things, to teach you things, to demonstrate some things, to give you some empathy so that when someone else is going through that hard time, you can say, I've been there, done that, felt that, and here's how God was to me. Bad things often get used for good things. We all should remember that. But it's also true that sometimes bad things come into our life because God is trying to get our attention bad things are because of bad things sometimes we don't always like to think about that because it's like whoa what's going on in that person's life but the truth of the matter is that's one of those things and so if we're going to think as mature believers as mature people of God we've got to recognize the validity of that aspect of it again it's not all pain and suffering but there is that slice that sometimes is God being a good parent, disciplining us, putting some pain in our life so that we'll wake up and say, oh my goodness, I'm in the pig pen like the prodigal and I need to run home to the father. What does it take for God to get your attention? Now here's the thing. God does that in our life as, as children of God, as the people of God. God does that with unbelievers. I think one of the things God does is, is God will put some pain into an unbeliever's life to draw them to himself, to help them recognize, man, I, I need to be in right relationship with the creator of the universe. And so it's not just us, his children that... He uses that uh, tool for sometimes he does it with unbelievers and that's actually one of the things we're going to start seeing here in the book of revelation now we've been walking through the book of revelation we took a long break during the christmas season and we resumed that study last week we're calling the whole series jesus reveals because when you look at the book of revelation this vision that god gave to the apostle john when he was late in life uh, probably 80s, 90s years old, he, this vision that he saw, when you see Jesus Christ in that vision, 
it really enhances your, your respect and admiration and, and, and just your, your overall perspective on who Jesus Christ is. It's not different from the Gospels, but it, in addition to the Gospels, it, it, it provides us with that complete and total picture of just exactly who Jesus is. Now, we've been doing this for, for many Sundays, so where are we in the story? Where are we in the vision? Well, here's where we are. If you look at the screen, in chapter 4, in the vision, John was taken up to heaven, and he was brought into the throne room of God. And there he saw this magnificent situation that uh, was there, and, and God the Father was holding a document. It was a scroll. And no one was able to open up that document except for the Lamb, who was Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. And Jesus, the Lamb, takes that scroll and he proceeds to break the seals that were holding that scroll together. And with each seal that was broken, more of the document was revealed. And we saw that. And so when you got to chapter 6, you, you saw what the first six seals revealed. Every seal, when it was broken, revealed more content to this document that was laying out how God was going to bring about justice. And when you got to uh, the sixth seal, there was this incredible earthquake. And by this time, 25% of the world's population, if we're going to take this stuff literally, 25% of the world's population was dead. There's 8 billion people on the face of the earth in the first six seals, which we think is going to last about three and a half years. Two billion people are dead. The world's population goes from six down to eight, or uh, from eight down to six. 25% are gone. Well, then last week we got to chapter eight, and the seventh seal was broken open. And the seventh seal turned out to be seven more judgments. In fact, I put this uh, on the screen last week. The seventh seal is the seven trumpet judgments. Uh, why are they called judgments? Okay, we understand the seals. There's a document, and that document is sealed up, and with each seal that's broken, a little bit more of the document can be revealed. What's the deal with these trumpets? These trumpets are like, you know, you know, let's pretend we're in uh, London and King Charles is coming in and someone blasts a, a trumpet announcing something that King Charles wants to be announced. That's, that's the figure here. So here were these seven trumpeters, these seven angels that were given trumpets and they were going to blast uh, those trumpets and with each one there was going to be a judgment more poured out on the earth. And last week, we, in chapter 8, we walked through those first four trumpet blasts, trumpet judgments. And interestingly, if we were just to tally it up, we think the world's population went from the 6 billion that it was after the sixth seal down to 4 billion. In other words, by the time you get to the fifth trumpet blast, the world's population, if it's in today's numbers, goes from 8 billion down to 4 billion. And that doesn't even take into account all the destruction and all the pain and suffering that goes along with just being alive at that time. So we're seeing in the book of Revelation, we're seeing just, just this cataclysmic judgment on God's, on, on, from God on the earth, on humanity. Well, today we're in chapter 9. So if you've got a Bible, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 9. Because we're now going to open, or hear, the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet. One more little detail, just uh, kind of by way of housekeeping, just to help you track with it. The fifth trumpet, sixth and seventh trumpet 
are also called the woes. Look at chapter 8, verse 13, the last verse of chapter 8. John is, John is saying this. He, I mean, he's just heard these four trumpets, and more people have died, more horror has happened, and he's seeing it all going on. He said in verse 13, he says, I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying, Whoa, 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 to those who dwell on earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpet and the three angels who are about to sound. So the fifth trumpet, it's, it, it's, it's, it's bad, but it is, it's a really bad one. And he's saying, man, it's a woe. It is like something that everyone needs to stand up and pay attention to because this stuff is just getting worse and worse and worse. If you picked up one of the bulletins in the back and you see the little outline on the back of it, I titled this message basically Hell on Earth because that's what it is. I mean, this is God's wrath, God's punishment, God's discipline trying to get people's attention what I want to do is to read it to you I know this takes two or three minutes but remember back at the chapter one there was that promise blessed is he who reads I want that blessing and blessed is he who hears I want you to have that blessing the words of this prophecy so I want to read it to you chapter eight, uh, 9 verse 1 it says and the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to earth, and the key, of, and the key to, of the bottomless pit was given to him. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. And out of the smoke came forth locusts upon the earth, and power was given them, as the scorpion of the earth have power. And they were told that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor the green things, nor any tree, but only men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will, will seek death and will not find it. And they will long to die, and death flees from them. And the appearance of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. And they had hair like the hair of a woman, and... Uh, and, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to the battle. And they have tails like scorpions that, and stings, and, and, and their tail is their power to hurt men for five months. They have a, as a king over them the angel of the abyss. His name is, is in Hebrew, it's Abaddon, and, and uh, in Greek, it is Apollyon. That's the first woe. It's past. Behold, two woes are still to come after these things. Here's the second woe, verse 13. The sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they might kill a third of mankind. And the number of the angel of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the, vo the number of them. And this is how I saw it. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders, they had breastplates, the color of fire and of hyacinthia and, and uh, hyacinth and of brimstone and the heads 
of the horses are like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths proceeded fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, by fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. And the rest of mankind, the ones who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hand, so as to not worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and of the stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. And we'll just stop right there. So what do we have here? We basically have the next two judgments. The fifth trumpet judgment and the sixth trumpet judgment. And they're so bad that they're called woes. And, and the first one, I mean, that, that's pretty bizarre. I mean, did you pay attention as I read it? Go back to, go back to uh, uh, verse 1. The fifth angel sounds his trumpet, and then here's what comes. He says, I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. Now, that word star is the word shining and and as you if you've tracked through the bible sometimes you recognize that sometimes a star or a shining is referring to what we call stars but often in other places angels are referred to as shinings or stars and the way this is here it's obvious that this seems to be indicating this is more of a being a creature an angel that is coming down. Uh, just if you want some cross-reference, Isaiah 14, we know that Satan, he, he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. In Isaiah 14, he's called the, uh, the morning star. Uh, there, the other places, uh, in Revelation 12, when it talks about Satan falling from earth and uh, or falling from heaven and it says he swept away a third of the stars. And we think that's kind of indicating that when Satan fell, that we're talking way back, eternity past, when Satan fell, when his pride was found in him and sin was found in him, Satan uh, uh, left heaven and he took with him a third of the angels. He swept away a third of the stars of heaven. And maybe that's the origin of demons, these fallen angels, these demonic beings that uh, the Bible often refers to. So when it says here in verse 1 that a star fell, it's probably referring to an angel who's been given these keys. Now, is this a good angel or a bad angel? I mean, it seems like he does a really bad thing. He goes and opens up this pit and lets out a bunch of locusts. But that's what God wanted. So I tend to think this is actually an angel. He's not a bad guy. He's a good guy. He's, one, he's on our side, if you will. Okay? And so this angel comes down. He's got the keys to the bottomless pit was given him. And you say, okay, this, this is really getting freaky. Okay? What in the world is that? Evidently, there is some kind of an abyss, a pit, where God has sent demons that were particularly bad say when well, where, where, where are you kind of getting that well one of the passages we're getting that from is do you remember in mark chapter 5 of course you do you all read your bible through every year you've been doing it for years you know exactly what happened in mark chapter 5 mark chapter 5 is when jesus and his disciples uh floated across the sea of galilee they had had a big storm the night before which uh you know if you'd have been in the Gospel Projects community group, you would have heard all about it. Well, when they got to the other side, they were there, and, and the place they happened to land there on the Sea of Galilee was a cemetery. And they go up in the cemetery, and lo and behold, there's some man up there that had not have any clothes on. He's 
out of his mind, and he calls himself Legion because he is so demon demonically possessed. He, he says, my name's Legion, and if he's Legion, I mean, that means he's got like 3,000 demons inside of him. And what does Jesus do when he meets this demonic, demon-possessed being? He casts those demons out. But if you remember in the story, you can go back and read it sometime. The demons tell Jesus, please don't send us to the abyss. Please don't send us to the pit. So what does Jesus do? Instead, he sends them out. They go inhabit the pigs, the herd of pigs. The pigs run off the cliff and they all drown. You're saying, wow, that's in the Bible? Yeah, if you read the Bible, you'd get it. a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, it, it enlightens a lot of my stuff, too. My sermons will make a lot better sense if you cross-reference them with the Bible. Um, that's a joke, by the way. Um, okay, so this, this pit is evidently, maybe it's a figurative one, maybe it's a, a literal one, but it's this place where demons that evidently have been extra evil God, who is still in control, but given them a long leash, God has put them there. And this, de this angel comes from heaven, unlocks it, and what it comes out? All this smoke comes out, but basically what we find out is that it's not really smoke, it's these locusts that have come out. You ever seen that situation? You probably have. I remember we had bees. Uh, George wanted to raise bees, so for a couple years we had some beehives. And uh, uh, when I found out that he wanted bees but didn't want to take care of bees, we got rid of bees, if you understand my drift there. But uh, I remember one day when the bees decided that the Hornock hives were not the place to be, and I'm on the front side of my house, and I'm hearing this zzzz, and I walk around my house, and if you've ever been to my house, you know I've got some really mature pine trees, really tall ones, big ones. And there was a column of bees as tall as my pine trees above my hives. And literally, someone that knows all about bees told me what I saw when I told him what happened. He said, they were moving. They, it's like the queen, you know, you hear about the queen bee, it's like the queen had decided it's time to leave the, the hive and I saw they, 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 they left and I don't know I wish I would have known been smart enough to see if I could have followed them or whatever but you know it looked like smoke billowing out of my hives and I could hear the buzzing and all that stuff now go back and read what we just read here about these locusts and out of the smoke verse 3 out of the smoke came forth locusts on the earth and the power was given to them like a scorpion has, a, has power and they were told that they couldn't hurt the grass or the tr green things or the trees I mean that's what locusts normally do but these locusts which evidently must have been demons I think in the form of locusts or locust like creatures they weren't going to go wreck our grass or our trees or our shrubs or anything else they were going to go sting People. And look at who they could sting. They could sting anyone who didn't have the seal of God upon them. I'll come back and talk about that here in just a minute. But let's get through the rest of, the, of this little section. So they can go and they can basically sting any unbeliever. But that sting wasn't going to kill that unbeliever. It was just going to put a bunch of pain in his life or her life for five months see verse five they were permitted to kill anyone but they were not permitted to kill anyone but to torment for five months and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man i've never been stung by a scorpion i have been stung by wasps it's pretty painful these guys were stung and it hurt and caused so much pain and suffering. Verse 6, they wanted to die. 
that they couldn't die. These scorpions didn't, these locusts didn't kill them. Well, then look at verse 7. He starts describing them. Now, again, these things are locust size. I mean, maybe, you know, half the size of your thumb, but if you got really close in there, and if you ever did that, say with a grasshopper or a locust or something, you'd, you'd start seeing some stuff and you'd see, oh, okay, that, that kind of makes sense, this little description. Now, some of you are probably sitting and shaking your head and saying, why is he taking this so literally? Well, here's the reason. I mean, how in the world can you read such specific stuff and not take it literally? I mean, get, their sting is going to hurt you for five months. I mean, that's pretty specific. Not a long time. It's going to get you for a couple months. I mean, shoot, as brilliant as we are, we didn't even know whether you were supposed to really stay six feet away or ten feet away or whether you should wear a mask or not wear a mask. And, you know, some person that, that just kind of has an ache and a pain, he's got it because someone stuck something up their nose and said you got it. And then someone that was just sick as a dog, well, they really don't have it. You got, I don't know what you got, but you ain't got it. I mean, but here... We're getting all sorts of specific stuff. I mean, if it was, if this is just like really horrible stuff's going to happen, but you know, it's not locusts, it's not bugs, it's not insects, there's not a real sting, it's not a real, you know, and, and it's just going to last a while, but not. I don't think it would have been so specific. I mean, look at the look at the description. When 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 John looked at them really closely, these little bugs, they looked like they had a helmet on their head. I mean, you ever looked at a grasshopper real up close? Go to Wikipedia, look in, zoom in on the picture that they have there. They got these big eyes. They got a, kind of a thing there, and on the front of them, they, they do have something that kind of looks like it'd be a breastplate, you know, a little miniature one, kind of like what, you know, my grandson John would like to play with, you know, but that's, that's what's there. You, I, don't, I don't think you can read this stuff and, and say, just brush it off and say, whoa, that's, it's not really happening. Here's what I think really is happening. What John was seeing would happen at some point in the future during this time we call the tribulation, after the six seals, after the, the, the first four trumpets, judgments, what's going to happen? There's going to be a locust inv uh, invasion. And it, it is, it is going it, it to make COVID-19 pandemic look like a piece of cake. And, and people are going to get stung and hurt. And, and, and it's all demonically motivated and uh, they're inhabited. And they even got some organization. Look at verse 11. This, is, this, is, this isn't just a, 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 there's a queen bee, if you will. And uh, his name means destroyer. Apollyon in Greek. That's the first woe. What's going to happen? At some point in the future, after the other things that had already been described in chapter 6 and 7 and chapter 8, there's going to be this kind of a plague not going to take a lot of life it's not going to take any life people that died didn't die because they got stung these people that got stung they wanted to die but they can't die god makes them endure the full punishment of their state because he wants it to work in their lives and i said that uh, I come back to verse four the only people that were going to get stung were people that didn't have the seal of God. Now, go back to uh, chapter 7, where we learned about in kind of the little parenthesis and the little pause between the judgments, it talked about how God was going to seal 144,000. They were going to have God's seal on them. And it actually was even going to be kind of a visible seal you say, well, wait a minute, is this the mark of the beast? No, the mark of the beast comes later. This is the seal that God put on them, and it was a seal of protection and a seal of empowerment. And these 144,000 had that. 
But it seems like there's a couple of the passages that seem to indicate that when, as they lead people to faith and trust in Jesus Christ and they tell them, hey, here's what the real gospel is, that people that trust Christ also get the seal. And, and so it's not just referring to the fact that these locusts are going to stay away from the 144,000. I think they're going to stay away from all believers. The 144,000 plus anyone that has come to faith and trust in Christ as a result of the 144,000's ministry because they have the seal of God upon them. Now, let's just liken this to uh, a little bit to our situation. If you're here today and you've trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, Ephesians 1.13, you ought to write that down, Ephesians 4.30 talks about how you as a child of God who has expressed faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happened to me when I trusted Jesus Christ as a little boy is I was sealed by the Holy Spirit. One of the things that happened to you when you trusted Jesus Christ, you were sealed. Now, is this the same seal that Revelation is talking about, or is this something else? I don't know, but it, it, it's similar, and it's interesting to me that people that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, whether it's pre-tribulation or even post-tribulation time, during the tribulation, they've been sealed by God. And what does that sealing do? It's two things, lots of things really, but two main things. There's an empowerment and there's protection. And so before I jump and move on to this next bad judgment, this next woe, let me just kind of put a little application in here. In the same way that believers at that time will be protected from these horrible little locusts that are going to come and sting you and it's going to make your life miserable for five months, you, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, you have that same kind of protection because you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. You may not sit and think about it very often, but you should. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 20, uh, 19 and 20. We've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our, our bodies are not our own. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. A person that does not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior does not have the Holy Spirit. They might be the nicest person in the world. They might be nicer than any of us Christians here. But if they, don't, if they haven't trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the Holy Spirit is not indwelling them. They can't produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. When I love, when I'm patient, when I'm kind, when I'm gentle, when I'm compassionate, that's the fruit of the Holy Spirit in me because I've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And you have too. And, and you know, just to, to carry this thing a little bit further, I mean, in the same way that, that these locusts were attacking these unbelievers, but not attacking the believers, because the believers were protected because they had that seal, you are protected. I mean, there's an old saying that talks about how a believer cannot be demonically possessed. And that's true. But here's the one thing that we often forget. A believer can be oppressed. You can dance so close to, to wicked and evil, sinful things. Uh, and there's probably not, in reality, practically speaking, that much difference between possession and oppression. I know a lot of believers that have, have wandered from the faith because God was trying to get their attention and they kept ignoring Him, and their lives are miserable. I mean, one of the things that is just amazing to me is just how the, the difference in how our culture, I mean, we, we, we now today just embrace things. Not we, but our culture, we embrace things that are just absolutely wicked. And, and I, I think back of my parents, particularly my mom, and she would be horrified at some of the things she would see now. I mean, she was raised as a 
you know, in a very conservative believing home. And uh, I mean, but as a nation, we've gotten so, so tolerant of very wicked, demonic things. I remember when I was teaching an ethics class over at the college, one of the students was particularly upset at me because I didn't get, I didn't talk about her religion. One of the things you get to do in ethics class is you get to talk about what do Jews think, what do Christians think, what do Muslims think, what are these others, and kind of explain all the different philosophies of life there. And, uh, you know, I had talked about the big three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And she was very offended because I didn't talk about her religion, which was probably older than all of them. She was a witch. She was our, one of our local witches here. And I thought, here I am in East Texas, in little old Christian Texarkana, you know. We're the hole on the buckle of the Bible belt. I mean, we're, we're it. I mean, there's, there's more people that are members of churches here than, than live in the town. I don't know exactly how that happens, but I think some of us need to clean up our membership rules. But, uh, uh, I mean, and here was a witch in my ethics class who was very offended that I even had the audacity to not present the alternative side to it. I mean, it's out there, and if you're a parent or a grandparent, you, it is your job to protect your children from this stuff, to educate them and help them to understand that, that there, there's just some things we need to run from and keep our distance from. Okay, well, that's the fifth trumpet. Let's look at the sixth trump, though. We're going we're to go a lot faster here because this is, this is harder even to understand than the first one. The sixth angel, this is verse 13, the sixth angel sounded, and I heard the voice of four horns of the golden altars, which is before God, one saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Not a... You know, okay, what in the world is this about? But evidently, it's like there's four angels that are stationed at the river Euphrates. And by the way, if you get out a map and you figure out where the Euphrates River is, I mean, and you were to, to, to say, where is the hot spot of, of conflict on the world stage today? It is right there. I mean, it basically, the Euphrates River, if I got it right, is, is kind of almost like the Rio Grande between Iraq and Iran. I mean, it, it is just right there. And, and evidently, these four angels are there holding back, but now they've been given permission to release. And you can skip down to verse 16. The number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I mean, even today, that's an impressive amount. I heard the number of them, and this is how I saw them. And then he goes on to describe these, these horses, and you're like, well, okay, this is kind of ancient or archaic. I mean, horses in today's military warfare, I mean, we got drones, we got this, we got that, nuclear weapons and all these things. I don't know exactly how you fit it in. But again, this paragraph so specific on so many things it, it'd be very very i mean you got to really do some mental gymnastics to just brush all this off and say well these are bad times this, this, this is this is something that it seems like john is describing that is very literal but here's the thing i want to point out and and i don't know how you could brush this away in a non-literal way look at verse 18 a third of mankind was killed by these three plagues, the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone, which proceeded out of the mouths of these horses, these weird horses. A third. Well, man, let's do, let's do the math again. We got eight billion. The first six seals took two billion of them away, so now we're down to six billion. The first four trumpets took two more billion, now we're down to four. We got a world's population at this point in time, if we're going to take this stuff at face value, of four billion people, and a third of them just got killed. So now literally the world's population is somewhere south of three billion by the time this thing ends. That's the sixth trumpet. And this 
you know, just to plug it into a timeline, this is towards the end of the tribula what we call the tribulation period or the great tribulation period. But here's where I want to focus these last couple minutes I've got. Look at verse 20. This is really amazing because, you know, okay, we want a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of food for thought, probably want to go back and read this passage a few times and, and try to understand it a little better. But let's just ask the question, okay, so what? Why did we need to take a Sunday to look at this particular chapter? I think verse 20 and 21 kind of give us the so what. I mean, at, when all this is done, a person alive could probably sit back and think, you know what? We're getting close to having 75% of the world's population dead in the last four, five, six years. That should get your attention. But, Look at verse 620. The rest, the ones who weren't dead, the ones who were still alive, the 2.75 billion that I think if I figured it out right, the rest of, the man, of mankind who were not killed by these plagues, and you ought to underline this, did not repent. Did not repent of the works of their hands so as to worship uh, so as to not worship demons or the idols of gold or silver or brass or stone or wood. Verse 21, they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their immorality or their theft. I mean, what does it take for God to get your attention? In these people's case, what is it going to take? These people have witnessed 75% of the people, uh, three-fourths of the people in their lives are now dead, and they're still not willing to acknowledge that maybe there is a God out there who wants to get their attention and talk to them about his son who came to die for them. They did not repent. And we're going to stop right there in the Revelation story, but let me, let me just transition it to us. I started off talking, what does it take for God to get your attention? So that God will, will so that you will wake up and realize, oh man, I have, I've drifted away. I've, I've been just like the, the, the hymn said, I was prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, and Lord, I did it. What does it take for God to get you back? Here's the deal. God wants you close to him. He, God, God loves you so much, he does not want you to be like the, the, the prodigal in the parable that Jesus said, told about this young son that goes off and squanders this inheritance that he has. God wants you to walk closely with him. Well, if, that, if that's kind of one of the main takeaways out of this chapter, at least it is that I want to emphasize today, so what? What do I need to do? Let me just give you two things, and I'll quit. Here's the first one. We need to be very aware of our heart. You know, the, the truth of the matter is, you know, we may not like to think about it, but we are born sinners there there is a evil propensity inside each of us we are what the term that theologians use we are totally depraved we never have to teach a child how to sin we never have to to sit and say oh come on just say something really bad here, here let me tell let me show you how it's done then you do it we never have to show them that we never te have to teach them how to have a bad attitude. We never have to teach them how to, to, to lie when the pressure's really on. They just do that naturally. And we may not like to think about it, but the truth of the matter is every one of us is born in sin, as David said. And we are sinners. We have, it, when Jeremiah the prophet is talking about it, Jeremiah 17, 9, he said the heart is dece deceitful, it's desperately wicked. 
Who can know it? You can't even understand this thing. When the Apostle Paul was talking about it in Romans 7, he said, the things I want to do, I don't ever do. The things I should do, I don't do them. I mean, it, it, it's like he, there was inside of him. And, and, and here's the deal. When I trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as personal Savior, according to Ezekiel 36, we've been given a new heart. But here's the, here's the deal. God never took the old heart out. I get to have it till I die. You get to have yours till you die. So I am a person that basically has had a heart transplant, but the trouble is, is the divine doctor left the old one in there. Which heart am I going to pay attention to? Which, which will am I going to follow? Am I going to serve the Lord with gladness or am I going to disobey the Lord in all wickedness you are if you're here today as a, a as a believer you're a person with with two dispositions you're a person with two hearts if you will and you got to be aware of that you can wander and we're living in a time when the allurement is out there and, and all things godly have been questioned and are being doubted and made to look so foolish. And, and you've got to recognize that there is inside of you still a propensity towards sin. And if you don't exercise that spiritual heart, that righteous heart that God gave you, it will always be a slave to the other heart. Now, I, you can't eradicate it. Some theological positions say, oh, we eradicated it. No, it didn't get eradicated. It's there. Give yourself enough time on, in neutral, and you'll feel your evil heart very well, or at least other people will see it in you. You've got to be aware of that. And as a believer, you've got to recognize, particularly in, this, in, in, in the state where we are, I mean, it, it is so much of a battle to keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ and pursuing righteousness. You've got to be aware of what's going on inside of you. And you know what? Following on with that, I can honestly think, and it's like, wow, well, that, was a, that was a slick one. I can think of no better defense than to run to the center of the community of Christ. I can think of no better defense than to run to the center of the church. You've heard me say this for years. You've got to run to the center of the church. When you are out on the periphery, you, you are much more vulnerable because you're out there and nobody knows what struggles you're really facing. Nobody knows what, what you're looking at, what you're delving into, what, who you're having relationship with and who you're starting to listen to. There's no accountability. I mean, I mean it, it sounds so self-serving for a pastor to say, run to the center of my organization. It's not my organization. This is Christ's organization. This is, this is what... This is the family of God. And he says, one of the reasons I put it here was so that you could have that protection, that power that, that, that I want for you and you with, with other believers who also have the seal of God on them can together be a band of brothers and sisters that fight the ongoing temptation to wander away. know your heart and know your resource the church honestly I honestly think the community of Christ the local church it, it is the most undervalued underutilized asset you've got run to the center of the church let's pray father I want to thank you for the privilege of being able to uh just talk about uh, these horrible things that are going to happen. And Father, the lessons that we should learn for ourselves. 
because you've told us how humanity, for the most part, is going to respond to them, Father. We see ourselves there. We see our vulnerability, our temptation. And I pray, Father, today that we would wise up. I pray, Father, if there's someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as personal Savior, I pray, Father, that they would trust in him. They would recognize that perhaps the reason you had him here today was so that they could come face to face with the Son who died for them and gave himself for them. And I pray, Father, that they would trust in him today. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen.